That's my cue. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Really excited to um, welcome you to another Animal Matters um, talk, which is put on by the uh, Center for Animals and Public Policy. Um, I, my name is Shauna Dowling Geyer, and I'm Associate Director of the Center for Shelter Dogs, and I teach in the Masters in Animals and Public Policy program here at um, Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine at Tufts University. And really excited to welcome Dr. Marion de Marchelier with my best attempt. <laughs> um, and um, she's here to talk with us about behavior science. Um, she grew up in the French Alps where she started her veterinary career in a mixed practice, moved to Canada about 16 years ago to pursue specialized training, and now is an assistant professor at the University of Montreal in Quebec. Um, Marion is a diplomat of the American and European College of Zoological Medicine and of the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists. So welcome and we're looking forward to your talk today. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I hope you can all hear me well. Um, so it, it's definitely um, a challenge uh, to be just in front of my computer, not uh, with you, but I'm also excited that there are people uh, from all around the world. So um, this is it. So um, we all have to face um, different challenges during this uh, pandemic. Um, changes in routine are very stressful for the brain. Uh, I'm both a mom and a teacher, and I find myself, like many of you, uh, torn between the workload, online lectures, and homeschooling. So this is my daughter, Harmony. Um, while she has time to do stuff because I'm working on the computer, uh, she's very creative. As you can see, she cut her own bangs, and she was very proud about it. She also ate all the chocolate in the house, which uh, didn't uh, make me laugh at all, not because I was concerned about her health that much, but because I didn't have any left for me. Um, so I thought it was a good way to start with her because she's definitely the reason why I started to study behavior. So um, let's go back in time a little bit. So maybe that was a, a little too, too long ago, but I just wanted you to know where I'm coming from and why I got to study behavior. So a little story about uh, what I've done, I think will help you understand better about uh, what I'm talking about in this talk. So I grew up in France um, in the French Alps. So I'm surrounded by exotic pets and, uh, and horses. And uh, I uh, did my vet school in France, in Lyon. And um, I wanted to do mixed practice, which is basically what I do now. It's just the term mixed um, is a little wider than what I originally uh, expected. So after vet school, I really didn't want to hear uh, anything about uh, school anymore, which is so funny after I've done now two residencies. But when I was in vet school, it was like after my fifth year, I'm done. So um, I, but eventually my love for wildlife got me to cross the ocean to do an internship with uh, wild birds of prey. And then I decided to go back to school. So I did this internship and I did a residency in zoo medicine. Um, so I worked with exotic pets and all type of uh, wild and zoo animals. So um, I thought I had the best job in the world and I, I think I do. Uh, but um, you could think that I would be the happiest vet, but there is always stuff bothering me. I had some of my patients, like Zoe, where I felt not good enough for her. And there were, there were other things um, that I, I, I didn't feel like I was making a good job, like Theo, this little Lord Heat that you can hopefully see. So he's grinning. And this is a, a normal grooming pattern, except that you would think it's an accelerated motion. But no, this is real to Theo, the first time it was presented to me. And you can see there is feather picking, and this is clearly an abnormal behavior. The other behavior is that I, I couldn't really, I didn't feel I was super good with them. It's like all the self-mutilation, like, this jaguar here that is chewing off his tail and all the other self-mutilation that I could see in my patients and I, I didn't feel I was doing a good job. And finally, I told you I was riding horses and I met Bo Henry. 
a cribber, and I didn't understand why he would do that. That that was a mystery for me. And also, there's been another big thing linked to behavior that has been disturbing me for a very long time before I started to study behavior, and uh, it's the suicides that are happening in our professions. Suicides in, in any person has always been a, something really, really disturbing to me, but it, as a vet, I'm like, we have the best job in the world. Why would you kill yourself? That, that was something that was just like, I could not understand it. But then, um, as I was a professor uh, in zoomedicine in PI, I had to face the biggest challenge in my life. And you'll see I don't have much challenge in my life, obviously, but that was the biggest to me. And I was completely not prepared for it. And I felt really hopeless. And this is my challenge. So I got a baby and I went through, through so much during our first year that I really decided that I had to study behavior. So I started a, a residency in behavior at the University of Montreal while still working as a, a zoo medicine clinician. So I learned a lot of fascinating things at that point uh, during this residency, and I wanted to share a few of them today. So uh, it is all about the brain. I think the brain is the missing link. The, 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 the key between all these questions I had uh, lies in this organ that I'm studying. So. The first question that we should ask ourselves is what does control our behavior? Um, I think when we think about it, most people will say, well, our behavior is mainly or partially driven by our genetics. And that is absolutely true. I mean, if, if I'm a bird, I can fly or can learn to fly. If I'm not a bird, I, there's, it's unlikely that without a plane or some sort of device, I'm going to be able to fly. So our behavior is first coded into our genes. But the second thing that is extremely important for <clears throat> to, to decide what behavior we're gonna um, show, display, is the environment. So I think that has been pretty well understood for a year that we depend on our, we put our genetics and environment and this is how uh, we behave. But what we know now, and it's a more, a slightly more recent discovery though we could have observed it since forever, is that the environment actually affects our genes. And um, that is very, very, very important. Why? Because we have a lot of genes, but we do not express all of them. We have tons of genes that are there, but we never use them. Why are we expressing one gene versus another, it's linked to the environment most of the time, and it's what's called the, <clears throat> the area of epigenetics. And for me, understanding this concept has changed a lot of things because it means we are not the victim of our genes anymore. It's not like, oh, I'm born like this, I have this personality that I inherited, it's a fatality, I cannot do anything about it. It is not true, our brain changes all the time, not just when we grow up, not just when we're kids or teenager, all our years. So it's true that we're born with a set of genes and sometimes these, these genes carry some mental disorders because they're the highest, uh, they have the highest uh, what we call heritability. So um, they're more transmittable uh, through uh, families than other diseases. That is true, but the brain still can change. Um, and one, one way I like to look at it is actually that the more you perform a behavior, the easiest it becomes. So when, when you perform a behavior for the first time, in your brain, it's like going through the woods where there's no trails, no trail. It's very difficult, there, there's no path. So you need to cut the branches, it's hard, it's tough. Uh, you're not sure you wanna keep going, you're really not knowing where you're going. So that's how the brain works. It, it doesn't like doing things it's, it's never done. But once you've gone through this trail once, then a second time and a third time, and you keep going on this trail, it becomes much easier. And that's what the brain does. It gets more synapses and they're more myelinated. So the behavior becomes easy and it's like driving on the highway and it gets super, super easy. So we really used to believe that we could 
change our brain just during childhood, that the environment was so important during childhood and teenagehood, and that we were pretty much stable in our brain. Nothing is, is, is as false as that. Yes, there is a lot of activation, but uh, we can change our little life. So I like this, this study that has been done in this uh, cute little owl monkey. I don't know if you see this. I, I, um, I don't know if you see my video because you're sharing that. I hope you don't, but. Um, um, so this, this is a study that was performed um, to study what's happening in the brain when you perform the amputation of one finger in a monkey. So this was the brain of the monkey before finger amputation. And you can see this, these are the parts of the brain coding for um, the different fingers. So the thumb, finger two, three, four, five. Okay, so these are the area controlling the movements of each fingers in the brain. So if you amputate the third finger in this monkey, what do you think is gonna happen with this area? Because it's useless now. So do you think it's gonna be all necrotic or it will stay there like this? We didn't know. But what actually happens over two months is that this area is completely replaced. And as the monkey doesn't have a third finger anymore, is using his second and fourth to do the same uh, behavior. And uh, then, uh, oops, it's, it's replaced. So this area is not useless, it's replaced. So this will change all lifelong. I don't know if someone wanted, if there was something on the chat or something. Do you, please interrupt me, uh, Jeannie, if, if it doesn't work well or if there's anything wrong. Okay. Oh, that was just, that was just me telling everyone to enter their questions in the chat. Sorry. Excellent. No problem. <laughs> no problem. Um, so that's, I think that's an interesting uh, study to see that the brain is not just waiting there. It's, it's doing things. It's changing all the time. And we, could, we don't need to cut brains of monkeys to understand this. Uh, if some of you have ever traveled in the, round, in the world now, we all have our laptops, so we keep our own laptops. But if you're old like me, maybe you've experienced changing computer from Europe to North America or other parts of the world. And when you switch from a QWERTY, QWERTY keyboard to an AZERTY keyboard, you know the A is there. <laughs> and still, your brain will just keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it, because this is the highway, this is how you've trained your brain. And if you know you're going to repeat this mistake a couple of times before you actually finally teach your brain that this is the right way to do it with this, okay? So this is, this is really the, 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 the neuroplasticity. It's the, the brain can change, but once it's there, it likes to do it the same way, okay? So let me introduce you to a few of my patients so I can uh, show you how this all applies in, in, the, in the real life. So yeah, so what this means is that we knew the brain can affect our behavior, but what is super important is that our behavior affects our brain. And this brings a lot of solutions for some of our patients. So this is, this is Kuan. So is, um, he was at the time a one and a half year old jaguar that was consulted because he was chewing his tail. So uh, he was creating wounds on his tail and he was doing this behavior 7% of his time, which is a lot. So what would you do? Why do you think he's doing that? Is this even a stereotypic behavior? But what's, what's a stereotypic behavior? I know, you know, when the, the things have so many different definitions and no one can agree on them, I think we're just not describing them well or they're not a thing uh, because otherwise we would be, we should be able to describe them well. So also, can we treat this cat? If he's doing this, he's already been doing this this whole life. Should we just amputate his tail so he stopped doing it? Well, in my residency, I've been lucky enough to have a fantastic mentor. And she's done several studies on dogs leaking surfaces like this little guy when there is absolutely no food on it. Or dogs biting, uh, fly, doing fly biting, catching imaginary flies. And uh, what Diane uh, and her collaborators have shown is that these behavior that we thought were compulsive behavior and that we were not really good at treating were for some of them actually caused or linked to underlying gastrointestinal disorders. And when you treated these GI disorders, the dogs stopped doing the behavior. 
So I was like looking at this and I'm like, well, this makes sense. When I have gastric reflux because I'm chronically stressed and my, my brain thinks I'm in survival mode and it's not time to digest. So this slows down my, my um, gastric um, gastrointestinal time and then I have reflux and I do stupid things like trying to eat stuff. So it's what humans do. Cats do things like that when they have GI pain too. So I'm like, huh, that's very interesting. So let's see what my my jaguar has. And we've done some medical workup on him because every time an animal has a behavior disease, we, we do everything, try to find anything that could create the behavior, but we had found nothing on our preliminary investigation. But when I wanted to look at this GI tract, people were like, uh, Marion, he's chewing his tail. I don't think it's in stomach. You know, there's like, oh, are you out of your mind? So I'm like, oh, well, let's try some omeprazole. So we gave him a meprazole and had the student do the ethogram and it went from seven person to his time doing it to almost zero. And I say almost zero because on the study was zero, but I don't, I don't believe in zero in behavior. Um, so I'm like, oh, there's definitely something here. It gave him a meprazole and he's doing it less. Huh. So I got the right to biopsy this animal and long story short, he had eosinophilic gastritis, which is an inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and, um, you know, like in the family of Crohn's disease in humans or celiac disease, things like that. So this is an inflammatory condition that is causing pain in this cat. And we treated him, we treated his gastric condition and he got immensely better. And we didn't need to amputate his tail like so many Jaguar in his family because it's an inherited condition. This is uh, another of my patient, Elf. He's an Emelian bear and he presented for pacing. And I called it the, the bear dance because it was super stereotypic. So when we say stereotypic, on, even if I don't like the definition, you usually say that it's a very, very specific pattern that is repeated. And that's what Elf does. Exactly one leg on one stone on his little river, exactly the same thing. I'm like, why the hell is he doing this? I was like, oh, he's bored, he's a bear in captivity, he has nothing to do. Well, he has a lot to do, he's a nice enclosure. And especially he has not done this for 15 years of being in the same environment. Why would he start doing doing this now? Why is he suddenly becoming bored? So it appears that health had dental pain. We treated his affected tooth and then he stopped pacing. And two years later, the pacing came back. And like, again, we did some dental procedure and the, the, the pacing went away. So this behavior was his way to express his pain. So I think most of the time, abnormal behaviors are a clinical sign, a symptom. It's not a disease. Sometimes people call and ask me, how do you treat stereotypic behavior in zoo animals? But for me, it's the same thing as asking the question, um, how do you treat anorexia, which is losing appetite, in domestic species? Well, I don't know. It depends on what's causing it, okay? It's not a disease. It's a clinical sign. So we need to find what started this behavior at the beginning or what is still the trigger. Is it internal or external? It can be internal as the pain or it can be stress in the environment. Um, and what is the consequence for the animal, you know? Um, and we can often find a reason why and we can adjust the environment. But we cannot always do that. So this is O. Henry, my uh, craver horse. This is a perfectly healthy horse in a wonderful environment, 24-7 uh, out with, uh, with other horses. But if you, take his, if you took his crib color out, he would start craving and craving again, and he would never stop. So we know why craving starts um, in young stress horses, very often with gastric ulcers and other genetic factors involved. But we don't know how to treat, to treat it. It seems to never go away. So remember, when a behavior is repeated many, many times, it becomes the easiest path for the brain to go, and this is it. So how do we get from starting once an impulsive behavior to something that become compulsive and seems to have no sense, but we keep doing it. Well, this is not very well described and that's the dopamine pathway in the brain. It's pretty complex. There's nothing simple about brain function, but we can simplify it a little bit. So impulsivity is doing something sort of stupid, um, which means we're not listening to our prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is our intelligent or reason. It's like the good thing to do, the prefrontal cortex will tell us to do. But the ventral loop of the dopamine pathway 
um, are usually telling us to do something for an immediate reward. So sometimes we don't listen to the prefrontal cortex and we do something sort of stupid for an immediate reward, uh, like eating something really sweet or something like that because we're gonna get an endorphin release. So these, these weird behaviors are usually start with impulsive things, but how do we move to compulsive, which means we're completely ignoring the prefrontal cortex. We, we, the brain is not even able to connect and say this is wrong. We don't hear it. And we keep doing it, doing it, doing it, even if the reward is not there anymore. Okay, there could be a reward like craving horses could have endorphin release. But sometimes in the, some form of addiction, there's not even the, release, the, the reward anymore and the brain keeps doing it. So you could say, well, this is really a brain dysfunction, but how long would this happen in so many animals or so many humans if it's really a dysfunction? Where is this coming from? Or this used to be built on an adaptive thing because this is how we build habits. If every day that you're doing something and you get a reward and you keep doing it, doing it, doing it, do you really need to think about it every day and reflect on, is it really the way to go? Is it really what I should do? No, the brain is, at, is, is saving time and energy by moving from the ventral loop to the dorsal loop of this dopamine pathway, which makes us do and perform motor skills, motor function, um, without thinking about them, okay? Um, so uh, another example is like, have, have you ever like uh, been driving and you needed to go somewhere and you, you just took the path to work because that's where you drive every day? Uh, has it happened to you? This is what it is because habits are, embedded in the brain and we don't even think about it okay this is what is addiction and habits so it used to be something additive good for the brain but um, sometimes there's a dysfunction and that's how it starts so the good thing is that if we understand it, then we can treat it. And so how do we treat? Well, then we need to perform something else and stop doing this and, 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 and do it repeatedly so we can build new highways in the brain, okay? So the problem is, if you had a highway, yeah, you can stop driving on it, the grass will regrow through it slowly, but the asphalt will stay there for quite a while. So if you are getting into driving in the same place, then it's going to be super easy to drive on this highway again. Okay, so that's why when you switch from a keyboard to another, um, if you've been always um, on an Azerty keyboard in Europe and you move to North America and then you move back to Europe, it's going to be super easy to go back very quickly to because this highway in your brain is never completely forgotten. It takes a very, very long time. So when we want to treat uh, craving in horses, what we need to do is to leave them the options of doing the craving if we want, but to really put them in an environment when it's not the best thing to do. So we want no stress, no initial trigger, no pellets, no nothing that is can affect their, their stomach. We want them on forage with friends, with as much freedom as we can, and then we can start, we can treat craving. But it takes a very, very long time. And what I'm hoping is that future research will actually um, uh, allowed to use drugs and antidepressants uh, that will allow the brain to build these, these synapses and rebuild new trail much faster because um, most people think antidepressants are just acting on like serotonin at the synapse level but it's not th this is true but it's a very very small part of how antidepressants will work they actually help rebuild new neurons so there's neurogenesis and um, new synapses so they're really useful to to express genes much faster and much better so they can be really really helpful and i hope that we can help more horses that are craving because it's not all horses that we can put in this beautiful environment and craving has um, effects on their health so um, we definitely need to to do a better job for these horses and what about Zoe, my poor little African gray parrot that I show you at first? So Zoe could have had medical underlying issues. Most of them do, but this one didn't have, but she definitely qualified for uh, anxiety disorder as uh, we can diagnose them um, 
uh, I, I don't like putting diagnosis that much, but this, let's just use this uh, to, to make it simple. Um, but so well, Zoe, she was raised um, by humans uh, alone with no other parents since she hatched out of her eggs. How, how, do you think her, her genes activated normally during her development? Do you really think her brain can be any normal, any way normal? Would you be normal if you had been raised by a parrot? I, I doubt it. So let's look at what parrots do in the world. They, they fly to forage inside, they forage for hours, they scream to call each other, they groom a little bit, and they spend a lot of time resting all close to each other so they feel safe. Well, in captivity, my little Zoe could do uh, not much of this. I mean, she would eat in a bowl. She, she couldn't fly. Um, she had no friends. She couldn't really feel safe while resting. So what did she do? She probably started grooming. And then she plucked a feather and released endorphins. And then that felt good. And then she did it again and again and again. And you see where I'm coming from. This is the vicious circle starting again. So. I could spend an hour on this topic and parents, but in summary, I think we just need to let them be birds. First, have them develop their normal genes for birds before being a pet. So what can we do? They can be parent raised, they can fly. And I don't know if some of you have seen these, these beautiful free flight show like this uh, at Disney Animal Kingdom, they fly over kilometers. Um, also at the Indianapolis Zoo, they do that. And you will say, well, these birds must be wild. Can't believe them. No, 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 they're parent raised and, and they're super easy to train, actually much easier than most pet parrots. Um, but they have a great environment and they, we let them be birds first before being show birds. Um, so if we talk about development, because that's the main thing in, in what I was talking about in birds, um, brain development is super important. So let's see what you would have done with this little guy. This is Baiko. He is an hour old. Uh, he is an amur leopard and this is the most endangered species of philid in the world. There's barely 70 left in the world. No, no, no. Okay, this is a uh, zoom time. I had told her not to go. <laughs> this is Harmony. Oh, the little girl was talking about my great daughter. She's awesome. So she just found an Easter egg from last week. So she's very excited. Um, so we can, she can have more chocolate. So <laughs> let's go back to Baiko, uh, the endangered amur leopard, super endangered. So his parents were both over 10 years old and they had never successfully bred. The female gave birth to dead babies before, several times actually. So we decided to do a C-section uh, because no, no medical problem. I mean, we, we work this animal out completely and there's no problem. So it was like, okay, let's just do a C-section. Maybe it's a delivery thing. So we did the C-section and it took 45 minutes to resuscitate this baby. Believe me, that was the, the worst thing. It was actually much more painful for me to deliver this baby than uh, the little one you've just seen in the back. Uh, I was completely exhausted. I don't know if some of you have done resuscitation. I mean, we do it for five minutes and we're just exhausted. Uh, 45 minutes, uh, it was one of the more emotional moments in my life when this little thing finally started to breathe. So I started to breathe again. So now, here he is and mom is still asleep at the end of the surgery. What would you do? Would you take the risk to put this precious little thing with a genetic that is unique in the world back with mom that has never raised the cub in her life, already 10 years old, and is going to recover from a C-section uh, with a lot of pain, probably, because what can we give her? Uh, we can give her stuff, but not too much, maybe not as much as we usually do, because their milk is going to contaminate the baby. So what would you do? How would you feel about that? And thank God we had a plan because at that moment, there was no way I was putting this cup back with her after 45 minutes of resuscitation. But we had a plan and we followed the plan and we put the cup back with the mom with a good plan. So it's not like, oh, we just threw it with the mom. But um, we did it. And this led to this beautiful Baiko who is on all my slides. And uh, um, he, he did very well with his mom because that's what they need. I've, I've studied... Um, maternal behavior in several species. And when you just look at it, you know, you don't, you don't have to do MRI or imaging. You, you know this is important. There is a reason why uh, they need their mom. And we have multiple studies showing the impact of maternal behavior on future behavior, no matter if it's reproductive behavior 
or um, stereotypic behavior, for example. So, um, behavior science helps us with wildlife conservation, as you can see, um, but it also can be used in the wild. So, um, this is uh, a study that was done in Australia. And at some point, this uh, Argus monitor was really endangered because of this invasive cane toad. The, it was a new, new species and the, the monitors didn't know they were toxic, so they would eat them and they would die and then that would go very quickly. So to train monitors to avoid the toads, the biologists fed them tiny toads, tiny, tiny, that were toxic enough to make them really sick, but not to kill them. So their brain developed what we call food aversion. Food aversion is something fascinating because it's the only form of learning that, occur, uh, that occurs if the consequence of the behavior is delayed. Usually you do something, you have an immediate behavior, that immediate consequence, that's how you learn. But if you get food poisoning, you will get sick hours later and your brain will still be able to identify everything that you ingested that day as a dangerous poison that you should never eat again. So if you get a gastroenteritis or if you get drunk, your brain might associate it with the food or drinks you had that day and make you very noxious and sick and really not willing to ingest it the next time you want to have it. I'm sure many of you have experienced that. So, but aversion is usually the, not the way we go when we train animals or humans. We usually like something more positive than aversion. So what we like using is, uh, and science tells us it's the best way to go, is what we call operant conditioning and positive reinforcement. So these terms might be familiar to you or not. It doesn't matter. I'm going to show you what it looks like because that's what's important. So what we want is positive changes in behavior. Okay. So it looks like this. Uh, it looks like uh, my cat is training my daughter to feed her muffin and my cat is a very good trainer apparently. Um, but zoos are actually much better at, at training than I think anyone else and that's where I've learned um, what can be done and this is an elephant um, and I have the GoPro on myself and I'm, I'm just taking reds so if you look like there these exceptionally good trainers are just asking the elephants and that, that's that's the equivalent of training and to just voluntarily put her foot on the radiograph. So I don't know if there's any old horse folks listening, but are your horses uh, as well trained? I'm not sure. So, um, but this is how we do things with elephants. So when my pony, um, when my pony uh, jumped a, a super high fence and I was scared for her, um, that I, would, uh, I asked the ambulatory vet uh, from the vet school to go take rats and she said, I hope she's as well trained as your elephant. So of course she was not and she was a three-year-old and, and she was super active and I was like, oh, okay, there's no way we're going to have to sedate her. But I was like, oh, just give me two days and a little bit of hay because I was afraid she had laminitis. I was not going to load her with sugar. So I trained her to put her foot on something and I didn't know she had to put both feet. So um, the day of the procedure, as you hopefully can see, she had to put both feet on the thing and that doesn't look as much as it's far from being as good as the elephant but still she's not sedated and she's in problem solving mode she's like what do you want me to do so she's trying to find the good option and she did and this is in real time this is exactly the time it took us to take the rods and I trained her only twice before that so it's very easy to do even if it's imperfect but anyone can really do that and no, no, because sedation is not a bad thing. I wouldn't mind sedating her, but it's a very relaxing uh, thing to do now. And uh, it, it's, it saves time and money also. So you can do a lot of things with positive reinforcement that I never thought I could do. I've been with horses around uh, my, uh, uh, in my life and I never thought, I thought you needed to be like a super highly skilled trainer to do this type of thing. You just need a few carrots. It's super easy. Anyone can do it. It took me two sessions and I got her to do that. I also train her a more important thing, um, like for example, um, give me your eyes. So this can be pretty useful and there's a lot of other behavior that you can do. So um, to train um, the horses to do uh, things that are useful. But you're gonna tell me, oh, this is because it's a smart pony. Uh, no, you can do this with every species. Look, this is um, a very great zoo trainer, again, and you can train 
a cow to do anything. There's no problem. I don't know if you can see well, I hope so. And she's going to do um, an injection on the cow. And this is a real injection. There's things in the syringe. We're going to um, um, uh, sedate the cow to do an insemination. So look at this. She is just able to walk. Then she's going to do the injection. Again, this is a real injection. No contention, no nothing. Your feet, good. I know a lot of dogs that are not as well trained. Oops. So another thing that I think is very difficult to do, and I, I hope you can still hear me with, while watching the video. This is Sabrina. She's uh, one of the best trainers I've ever met. I've learned so much from her. Um, and this is, these are the most difficult behavior, painful behavior. So she trained uh, Shelly, this macaque, who is a diabetic macaque, very sick with um, ketosis and all, um, to come and put her finger here. And so I could poke Shelly. And then she would bring her hand back, even if I just poked her, to get the blood glucose level. And we could do this on a regular basis. And she's also trained for insulin injection. And we could do this repeatedly. And I was, I, I knew we could do that. And then at the same time, I had to bring my two-year-old daughter to the hospital for a blood draw. And it took three people to hold her, even if she had the MLA patches that I had put so she would not feel anything when they poke her. And they had to poke my little baby many times before getting blood. And she was screaming. It was a horrible experience. So I was like, why, why do I have to do this with my daughter? And it's apparently it's normal. There's like, oh, it's always like this with kids. We need to hold them hard. And I'm like, what? Why, why is it easier in the monkey? So I decided to train my doctor. And yeah, you probably think I'm a very bad mom and you'll see I am a very bad mom. But uh, I did train my daughter with M&M's pieces when she was a um, two-year-old. And the next time we went to the hospital for a blood draw, she was sitting on her chair all alone and gave her arm like this. And the great thing is when we were done, uh, they couldn't believe it. The nurses were like, oh my God, what have you done? My, I'm sorry, I trained her like a monkey with sugar. Um, and uh, I still put the amla cream so she would not feel anything. So it was not a bad experience for her. And then when we were done, the nurse was like, wow. And then she's like, okay, you can do the other one. So, because we always train on both arms. So this was really cool. I think training is so much better than having to deal with uh, fear of syringes. So we should always do this before we start. So there's a lot of other way we can implement uh, changing in our hospital with our patient. This was a mayor that was really, really uh, anxious when we were treating her full. Um, she would need to be sedated every day when we were doing the treatment of her full that was severely injured. So we decided to try something different. And so we, you need a student with good hands or she could have taken like a, uh, a brush or something. It would have been probably easier, but this mare loved being scratched. And after a few days, I think she actually enjoyed her full treatment and she was like looking forward to it versus before it was really a, the bad part of her day. Um, another, another way is uh, using drugs and a few years ago no one knew about gabapentin in cats or trazodone in dogs and now we use them quite a bit to decrease stress of our patients in the hospital because why stress them and why have bad experience? It's bad for them, it's bad for us. Also exotic folks, do you tickle your rats? They love it. I don't know if you can hear it well. If you don't, you should go uh, on the internet and check that out. So tickle your rats um, next time you have one as a patient because they love it. See, he's, he's following the hand. I love this, this is so cool. You can also do it with cattle. So this is the new way to catch, oops, to catch cubs. So might be a little better than the lasso. I hope you guys are seeing the video and still listening to me. It's so hard to do this with no feedback. Um, but this is a way you can catch the calf and then the mom can be around and even lick the, the baby and, uh, and take care of him. And they can do all the procedure they have to do. And then they could even move with uh, the calf. 
like this. And eventually, we can just uh, release him. There you go. Um, another thing that behavior science tells us is that we need to use enrichment in our patient's life. Very, very important. So we had a lot of aggression in our teaching mirror and just switching to these barrels full of hay outside instead of not feeding them anything outside dramatically helps. So this is always good improvement. And um, this is the dog of an exotic pet um, vet here at the vet school. And she is a always advertising for foraging for parrots, but she does it for a dog. And it's awesome, it keeps him busy. She watches him at home and he's, he's definitely much better since she's, she's doing this foraging stuff. So when they're happy, it makes us happy. And this is uh, the little Lori that I showed you at first that had the feather picking and the sort of um, agitation behavior all the time and he is doing much better. And they sent me this video. And even if you don't speak French, I'm sure you can understand. <laughs> Oh no. Sorry. Oh. Merci. Oh. Merci. Gentil, mon amour. I hope you could hear him well, but he's saying thank you in French and that was like the best video. I was like, oh my God. So happy patient, happy uh, vet team, that is for sure. But that brings me to talk about our own welfare, human welfare. So that's usually what we do when we're talking about our mental health or our stress. We just, we care about our patients, but we're really not good at taking care of ourselves. So the first thing is how do we define mental disease? What versus what other disease versus mental versus physical, mental versus medical? Well, mental diseases are very much physical and very much medical, but they're very poorly understood. So, if you have a, a cat or a human with diabetes, you can easily explain to your clients, uh, um, well, this is coming from the pancreas, this is how it works, and then as we know how it works, we know how to treat. But let's take an aggressive dog. How many of us can actually explain to our clients this is exactly what's happening in the brain? They, we just like, is the, the, born, the dog born mean and there's nothing we can do about it? It's, we sort of believe there's something, but we have no clue. Well, let's look at this cat study that I found really fascinating. So they took laboratory cats that were super nice and they put electrodes in their brain. And what they discovered is that if they stimulated the lateral hypothalamus, the nice cat would start stalking an imaginary prey. So showing predatory aggression. But if they stimulated the medial hypothalamus through the amygdala, these nice cats would become Halloween cats, attacking perceived threats. So aggression is structurally embedded in the brain because it's, it's used to serve a function. It's there, it's still a serve a function actually. But I found fascinating in this, in this study that these two types of aggression that are structurally different in the brain of cats are the same type of aggression we see in humans with like cold plan and sensitive predatory behavior versus aggression uh, behavior that can be triggered by severe emotions like fear or anger in humans. So, I have personally experienced how mental uh, disorders are um, clearly medical condition that we can induce. So I have celiac disease. I'm allergic to gluten. It's an autoimmune disease, not a real allergy. Uh, but I've been sick for many, many years uh, before uh, being diagnosed. And I had chronic weight loss. And at some point, the doctors thought that uh, I had an eating disorder. So they gave me an antidepressant. And I took one pill once. And what it did is actually, because I didn't need this drug, uh, it triggered a panic attack. And I had a panic attack. I was certain I was dying. I was incapable of breathing. I was screaming for help. But in reality, I was breathing perfectly fine. I was in a comfortable uh, bedroom and I had no stress around me. But this drug triggered the panic attack in, in my poor brain. Um, so uh, if we can induce a panic attack, of course we can treat it. The other thing I experienced is after the birth of my daughter, I had a weird, rare form of postpartum problem. And what happened is like about once a month for one day, for a very short period of time, thank God, I had suicidal thoughts. So it was like at one moment, I was completely normal, uh, tired, obviously. 
But then an hour later, my brain was clearly telling me that killing myself was the best way to go. So my daughter would have a better mom and a better family and everything would be better. So it was clearly a brain dysfunction caused by a sudden hormonal change. And it really led to a completely distorted reality. But for the person experiencing it, we do not realize it's a distorted reality. It feels real. It feels really real. That's what our brain is telling us. So as clear as when you have a dog that is aggressive to its shadow or to something that is clearly in its significance. For him, his brain is telling me this is a threat. I need to attack it. And, um, but it's not. So our brain is a very complex organ and sometimes it can dysfunction. And it can be very acute, like it was to me, or it can be very chronic, like any other disease. But if we recognize it as a disease, I think it helps. It helps me, it helped me, and it helped a lot of my patients. Because if you had a cat uh, that has PUPD, weight loss, glycosuria, would you say, oh, well, he's not in ketosis yet, so there's no need to worry. Um, a more simple example for non-veterinarians, maybe if you felt out of breath all the time, you had chest pain and irregular heartbeat for a week, uh, would you say tough enough, it will get better on its own, you're just being weak and lazy? I hope not. I hope you would consult a doctor. Well, mental diseases might be more complex, especially in humans because we all have our own, our own unique brain. No one has the same mental disorders that the neighbor, okay? There's a hundred trillion synapses in the brain. We all have different genes. We all have different environments. What are the odds that we're feeling the same as someone else? None, okay? Behavior is really the study of one. But if we understand the pathophysiology of many of these conditions, we can detect them much earlier, and then we can treat them. So I've, I've shown you how and why with the brain, you know, our behavior also control our brains. It's not just the opposite. It's not just the brain controlling our behavior. So avoiding to repeat bad behavior, forcing us to do the right ones, even if it's hard because it's a new trail, developing good life habits, even if it's really hard to walk on this path rather than driving on a comfortable highway. So we can learn to control our own brains. That's why people say meditation is good because meditation is learning to control your brain. Um, it, it's um, reducing its activity. We can get endorphins through sports and it, it, instead of drugs, it might be much better. We, so we can take care of our brain and learn how to take good care of our brain as soon as we see a, the beginning of a dysfunction. Because if you've never experienced it, people who've never experienced it, if I didn't have these two things that happened to me, I, I would still be like, I don't understand why people kill themselves. Well, now I know because their brains told them to do so. And it was as clear as, as, as water is like, okay, this is what I had to do. But this is the brain lying to us. This is brain dysfunction. This is how it feels. So having a code also to tell people around us, okay, I'm not feeling good because when we are in a really different reality, uh, if you're in panic, um, you're suicidal or depressed, very often the words that are coming out from us are also reflecting of how the brain thinks. And it, they can be hurtful, they can be bad. So pick a code. Like for me, it was ringing a bell. When I ring this bell, because I could still do that when you're not too, too bad, when you're getting there, you can ring this bell and say, this says, please help me. Don't listen to anything I say because I'm gonna hurt you. I'm gonna say stupid thing that makes no sense. But right now I just need a hug. I just need love. I just need to be treated or I need help, okay? That, that simple code uh, that people close to you would know might save life in some cases. So for sure humans are very complicated, okay? Uh, we're not just like animals. We have depressions, we have a lot of things. But, um, and we can feel bad for so many different reasons, but um, we know how we need to learn how to um, develop strategies to feel better and to recognize early signs. So I like just walking in the woods with the cat, I think is a good thing, but everyone can find their own ways of um, treating their brain dysfunction. And there's multiple, multiple ways. So I still think uh, we're not that different than animals. And yes, I did that. Uh, I told you I was a blind mom. Remember, I trained my uh, baby with uh, sugar um, for blood drill. Um, so I think we're really, really not that different.
She loved it. What's wrong with that? So, she loved it. It's a very good way of uh, uh, enriching your life. So to finish uh, uh, with behavior science, to show you how important it is to study this science and not just believe what common sense tells us. Um, what do you think, what, if you were uh, to do a commercial um, to uh, change people's behavior so they would protect the environment better, would you show them uh, nice beaches that would be nice if it was not covered with trash? Or would you show them Stefan, my uh, wildlife residency mentor, with his electric car? Well, I don't know what you would pick, but intuitively, most people think that educating them with how bad things are, rather than showing what you can do, is better. And actually, it's not true. Science um, and a lot of studies have shown that social norm is the most thing. Why do we change your behavior? Because the neighbor did so. Monkey see, monkey do. That's exactly how it works, okay? And you don't believe me? You, you think you're a teacher like I am and we think education is the most important thing and then when we know things, our prefrontal cortex will tell our, our dopamine pathway what to do? Not at all. You, you still don't believe me? Well, don't you know sugar and fast foods are bad? You do know. And do you still eat them? Well, I do. Do you know exercising is great for your health and sleeping eight hours or long nights of sleep is good? I'm sure you know that. Do you do it? I know it. Um, I think we're a lot of people who are smart and educated. Do we follow what our prefrontal cortex tells us to do? We don't because we're controlled by our dopamine pathway and endorphin pathway. It's very hard to win over them, okay? So, that's what behavior science tells us. And then when we understand better, I think we can change better and we can lead by example like Stefan. So as a conclusion, um, I think it was just a very quick overview of what you can do in behavior medicine and behavior science. It only takes our senses though to observe behavior, animal or human behavior, but with the new technologies, uh, we understand much better what's happening at the molecular and cellular aspects <clears throat> of um, uh, controlling the behavior. But I see it as molecules being letters and cells being words. And we put them all together, we assemble them in sentences with these synapses in our brain. But at the end, it only makes sense if you put all these sentences together, together and you read the whole book, uh, the book of animal and human behavior. And it's really full of mysteries and I think we, we still have a lot to discover. So I invite you to have a look at this little fish and I think this is an absolutely beautiful behavior and I thank you very much for your attention. And yes, you did all that. Thank you very much. And I will hopefully have a few questions. Hi, uh, we had our first question from Allison Staple. Um, I'm going to unmute you, Allison. So if you want to ask it, if you don't, I can ask it for you. Oh, um, I was just wondering when we talked earlier about like the cribbing behavior in horses and the licking the floor in dogs and um, like the chewing the tail in the leopard, or do you think that the fact that all of those are like oral fixations could have anything to do with the fact, like all of those animals turn to like an oral fixation kind of thing? And I've heard that that can be a comforting behavior. Do you think that that could be, like if it's a pain response, do you think that it could just be a comforting behavior that they're doing? Yeah, I think in, in, in the beginning, it has to be, yeah, it's, we call it comforting or coping, or there's multiple way of saying it. <clears throat> but what it says, it, it brings a reward. It brings them something. So you, you can call it comfort, that is, that is for sure. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. And the, there's other reasons why. I mean, when you talk about oral behavior, it's usually because some of these animals might have like giraffes in the wild or cattle, they use their cow, their, their tongue a lot to so have stereotypic behavior that are oral. But um, it's, there's, there's multiple reasons why it's oral. But in the end, it always brings them 
comfort or pain release, or at least they think that it does. Yeah, absolutely, you're right, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and we had another question from Kate Beckett. I gotta, there's, we had a lot of participants today, so it takes me a minute to find them in here. Kate, hi Kate, I'm unmuting you so you can talk. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to ask your question or do you want me to? Oh, it, uh, yes, I, uh, I'm asking because the, this is personal experience. We adopted, uh, he's a ch chihuahua mix and I have seen other chihuahuas that uh, are aggressive and he can be aggressive. And, um, and, and you know, you talk to people about this, so it was just in their DNA and uh, it's just the way they are. Uh, how do you override or, or, or compensate for those kinds of things? Well, these, that's why they, these, especially Chihuahua, they really take a, a veterinary behaviorist because we need to, as every abnormal behavior, uh, we need to do a behavioral therapy. So they learned another way to express themselves. If they're aggressive because they achieve something through aggression, so we need to make them able to achieve the same result without being aggressive. So we need to teach them that through behavior modification. But in Chihuahua, very often we will need the medication to help because otherwise their, their, their energy level, their adrenaline is so high that you cannot teach them. You know, we're super, when you're super stressed, you cannot learn. That's, a, that, that's also can be explained in the brain. Um, so sometimes the Chihuahua, we need antidepressant to help them relearn a more appropriate behavior. And we, so we always have behavior modification, environmental adjustment, and sometimes they need drugs. So uh, a veterinary behaviorist can help, definitely help. And we do a personal approach because each case is different. Okay, I was wondering about that. He, 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 he's gotten better, but uh, he, he is high strung, I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah, it's not easy. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for your question. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, I think that's all the questions I could find in the chat box, but I've, I've figured out how to let people unmute themselves. So if you have a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask at this point. Hi, Sophia. Hi, Sophia. I, I would like to know if there can be problems with uh, medication like antidepressants, like uh, can there be like an addiction? Can it become a problem? Oh, thank you. That's a great question. Well, it depends on which drugs we're talking about. But we're, we, when we say antidepressant in general, I'm talking drugs acting mainly like on serotonin pathway. Um, um, and these, you don't develop an addiction on these um, because the, the type of um, receptors they're acting on, there's, there's no uh, addiction to them. So usually they help to develop an appropriate behavior and then we can slowly wean them off and the behavior will remain because the brain has developed these new pathways, uh, these new highways. And then when you take off the drug slowly, because of course you don't want to do this too quickly, is the brain doesn't like sudden changes, uh, but then you don't need them anymore. So antidepressant can really be great helpers uh, for brain function. And there's no addiction to the drugs we usually use. Um, the old drugs we used to have, uh, like with benzodiazepines, we used to have addictions, but we don't use these too often anymore in, in animal behavior. Thank you. Okay, um, we have Jacob next. He did post one in the chat. Um, do you want me to read it, Jacob? Uh, let me unmute you. Jacob? Hi. Um, yeah, could you uh, just give some brief details on what the plan was to reunite the Amur Leopard Cub? Uh, like, what were the behavioral um, concerns that you had to work around with the mom? Well, you know, I think we need to be very modest with that. Um, once a cub was with the mom, there's really little impact it can have on her own behavior. Um, especially she was a very, um, she's actually a very anxious cat. These, these, and this is normal. I mean, these are very close to wild animals. We have very good uh, animals with very good genetics and we don't want them to be pets at all. So, um, 
um, we could not really intervene at all with our own behavior. So the plan was really just to um, try to remove as much um, as possible the smell that humans had put on the baby. So we actually took her um, pieces of the placenta and uh, we rubbed the baby with them so she would have to lick him. Um, and uh, we made sure we reintroduced her only when she was uh, very much awake, so, but with little intervention. So we placed the baby in the hide that she was used to, uh, that she had been offered in a long time. So she, she was used to her hide. She was going to deliver in there. So we put the straw with a lot of her smell in there with the baby. And only when she was really up, we opened the door and let her access to it. And we... We watched it all the time. I didn't sleep that night. I was on the camera. We had cameras everywhere. But I mean, honestly, if she had killed the baby, there was nothing we could have done. What we knew, though, is that when she had these dead babies, she actually, she didn't kill them. She didn't eat them. She actually took care of the dead babies. It was very sad. So we had the feeling that she would take care of him. But we had to try. We had to try. It was so important for his future behavior as an endangered species. We cannot get these normal behavior out of the genome. Because I told you, environment influence the gene expression, but this is transmittable to next generation. So it's very, very important that we keep normal behavior uh, in these animals so it's transmitted to the, the future generation that are gonna be released in the wild. And BICO is just um, one generation before the re releasable ones in the wild and, uh, and the, the SSP or EP program for this species. I don't know if I answered your, your questions. Okay, I don't see any more questions in the chat box, so I have again unmuted everyone, let, it, let everyone unmute themselves. Um, so if you do have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, so you talked about the uh, licking of the paws in the tail of the leopard. Now, in humans, a lot of times in babies, it's a self-soothing uh, behavior. Mm -hmm. And in the animals, you said that kind of behavior uh, was a digestive problem or, or what have you. It ended up being physical issues. What percentage would you say is a physical issue versus just a self-soothing uh, type behavior? Well, um, I think it's, um, yeah, you, it's an excellent point and I don't have a good answer. We need to study this more, but my, my, my um, idea is that you don't need to self soothe as a normal adult to the point of creating wounds on your tail. So like it's, I do a lot of parallel with sucking your thumb, you know, when yes. you're a baby, um, it's a lot of this suckling behavior. But again, if you go back to normal in nature, this behavior should be allowed through the contact with the mother. Um, baby, human babies used to be breastfed much longer than we usually do. And some babies will, will stop suckling very quickly and some other will keep doing it for self-soothing. And in, in the captivity, <laughs> captivity for animals or in our, our current society, we've switched that to plastic pacifiers or sucking your thumb or other behavior. So it's so self-soothing, but it's still soothing something. And I've observed it in like actually in Jaguar and actually the, 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 the cub from this male that I presented you, um, he bred, and one of the, the male cub kept uh, suckling on his mom for like almost a year. And I mean, after three or four months, these, they eat meat, they don't need milk, but this cub kept doing it. So I think you're right, there's something with the self soothing when they're younger, they need that. And if we don't allow them to have it, they'll find another way to do it. And as it's a self-soothing or comforting behavior, they, they feel good when they do it. So when they're in pain, like in this case, it was GI pain, but maybe he would have had arthritis and he would have done the same thing because that's his way to express his pain. And then he does it again and again and again. See what I mean? So 
absolutely. It starts with something that felt good. And in, in ferrets, in, in ferrets, in parrots, they remove their feather and it feels good because of this endorphin release. There's probably an endorphin release with this suckling behavior. Mm -hmm. um, but then it, it moved to something that can become problematic. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, it's something that I think in 10 years I'll have better answer on that. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, um, I've got a question. Um, I'm particularly interested in animal welfare indicators. And um, I was just wondering if there are any specific um, areas of behavioral research that you feel that are lacking, um, you know, they've been la lacking attention really that could impact and benefit animal welfare long term. Oh, definitely. Um, amphibians. Mm. Um, amphibians are, um, I think, in, um, in, in a group uh, class that has been very poorly studied. We don't know anything about animal welfare. Uh, for amphibians, and know very, very little. And they're super endangered. There's a, an extension, mass extinction of amphibians. Um, and I think wildlife welfare is something that we're not paying enough attention to. So I'm talking about the amphibians, but also, I mean, I'm, I'm starting to study well welfare mm -hmm. in the wild because it's not just about them dying but it's about them suffering because of our, our activities. So um, I think welfare of wildlife because of um, human activity is definitely something that close to my heart. Um, I think um, we're doing a lot for domestic animal welfare. There's a lot of studies. Are they good enough? Or are they enough? Probably not yet. We need to, to get better. But for many species, we're starting to have good indicator in domestic species. Mm. Um, but um, amphibians are definitely uh, the forgotten ones. Oh, thank you. That, that's really interesting. That's great. Because I've got my dissertation for my master's next year and wildlife welfare is something that I'll definitely be looking at and definitely within the amphibians as well. So thank you. Thank you very well, much. Thank you. I just want to remind everyone that um, I've enabled you to unmute yourself if you have a question. I don't see any more questions in the Zoom chat at the moment. There's still about 80 people in the meeting. <laughs> if you are having trouble unmuting yourself, just ch uh, send me a chat. Hi, um, this is Angela. I had a question because you had mentioned that you trained your, your daughter. I was wondering if you would have done anything differently if you, it sounds like you only have one daughter, like one child, if you would have done anything differently um, if she had a sibling. <laughs> Thank you. It's a great question. Um, I think it was so tough that uh, I, I, I just wanted one. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it was more the lack of sleep that was the, the I didn't sleep for two years, so it was uh, terrible in my brain. Um, I would do um, I would do everything different. I think parents uh, all, all learn a lot from the first one, but then the second child is different. So I think as parents, we always do our best with the knowledge we have at the time, and it's it's every time is different. Um, I think, uh, I, yeah, as a parent, I would just uh, give up on stuff much more easily. I would not uh, try to see if she was breathing every second when she was asleep. Or I, would, I would be much more relaxed, I think, than uh, I was. I think it's just uh, every parent is, is like this. We're just freaking out. Everything is new on the first kid. And then we're like, oh, my God, she's breathing. I put a breathing monitor on her because I, I was scared that she was. I would not do that. I would put her up on her abdomen if she wanted. I would do all the things that they tell you not to do. I would do it all on my second child so I could sleep. But uh, <laughs> uh, behavior wise, I think I've learned things quickly enough as problem arouse, arouse um, to, to do a pretty good job with her. But I mean, parenting is, uh, is a, a new science too, I think. <laughs> Hi, my name is Yannick. Yes. It's a technical question about uh, 
when you trained your daughter for the, I think it's about the blood draw. Mm -hmm. uh, what was your trigger for decide your criteria? <laughs> oh. Was it by observation or, or it about what she said or? Um, it was it was actually it was super easy. I mean, primates are so easy to train, um, and so I. I didn't do anything painful for her, so it was just a game. So my criteria was were very, very. Um, I mean, I just observed and things went well. I just wanted her to be fully engaged and happy and uh, playing. And um, if I could see a little bit of worry, I would I would back up, back off, and I was like, okay. Um, so, but it was it was super easy to train. I mean, everyone should do that for their kids. Um, I mean, this is, I had to take blood from her every year is not very often, but I see these kids with several blood draw and just telling them you're going to get chocolate afterwards is not as good as training. So it might seem weird. A lot of people are thinking I'm crazy, but I was like, I would do that again. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lindsay. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more about the um, the part where you were talking about aversives versus um, positive reinforcement. And you had mentioned that you prefer positive reinforcement. There's a lot of studies that show that it's better. Are there any points where you would consider using aversives and sort of at what point is that threshold? Well, there is a nice, if you, if you look up on the internet, um, Susan Friedman's um, behavior works website she has this type of um it's like a pyramid of what you can use first and then what you move to and that's the what they use for autistic children and i think we can use the exact same thing with animals so you always want to try positive reinforcement first and if you do it well it applies to like 99 percent of the behavior we want to change there's a few cases where you can move up the skill and there's a lot of uh, things between positive reinforcement and really aversive or punishment. There's a lot of different options in in between. So before we get to something really aversive and uh, punishment, um, we can do a lot of other things. But um, I I would say I mean anything that is life threatening or super dangerous, uh, of course I will use something punishing. Um, I mean it's just um, you know, when you walk a dog on a leash, the leash is not a positive reinforcement. It's adding something to remove a behavior to prevent them from doing a behavior. So I use it because it's a safety thing. So for anything safety, I, I think it's, it's difficult to say that we're using a 100% positive reinforcement. It's like when you train horses. You know, like for an elephant, you're protected. The elephant can get at you. So you have you need nothing punishing. You just can use positive reinforcement. If they don't want to do the behavior, if the tiger doesn't want to do the behavior, if the elephant doesn't want to do the behavior, too bad for the trainer. They just, the, the, the animal will just go away and leave. But when you're working with a horse in non-protective contact, the horse can injure you. So you need to protect yourself from this dangerous big animal. And so it's hard. I mean, I try to do as much positive as I can, but it's hard. And I think it would be hypocritical to say that we're doing a hundred positive because we need some measures of safety. And safety is very often associated with something that is mildly aversive, like just stay away from me. Um, it's, it's, it's sort of an aversive, but be, be, between a mildly aversive thing to teach animals and something that is painful or brutal or scary, there's, there's a world, you know, so I think we can, we can definitely use negative reinforcement in some form of punitive punishment. I mean, when you use positive reinforcement, you need to realize that you're always almost at the same time using the opposite. So you're, you're preventing them to have access to the treat if they don't do the behavior. So these are always all related, but um, unless it's really something that is a safety issue, I really try to work as much as I can uh, with positive reinforcement. It just, it works better, faster, and also 
the positive emotions that are associated to it uh, makes it better for tomorrow. You can sometimes achieve something faster with a punishment or a rough handling, but tomorrow this will be worse. Versus if you take the time to do it with positive reinforcement, tomorrow will be easier. So if you work for tomorrow and for long-term welfare and easy, easiness of, of um, handling an animal, you should favor positive um, uh, methods, I think. Does it Thank does you. It answer? Thank you. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, I want to respect your time as well, Marion. Um, so I, I, we could, we still have 60 participants if you want. I don't know what your time schedule is like, but we could uh, let it go till questions go till 1.30. Yeah, if sure. You know if time. people have more questions, I'm happy to answer. Okay. And um, after that, if they have questions, they can email us yes, and I'll nice. send it to you. Yeah. Okay. All right. So anyone else with questions, you can unmute yourself. Um, we're going to 1.30. you need help unmuting yourself, feel free to chat your request, <laughs> send it in chat. While we're waiting for um, questions, I also want, and I have a moment, I wanted to point out that um, I was referred to you uh, we found out about you, Marion, because of Dr. Jennifer Graham, our exotics vet at Tufts. Um, she looped me into the conversations you were having about coming to campus, and so I wanted to say thank you to Dr. Graham, because this we are getting a lot of thank yous in our comments right now. <laughs> oh, well, I see you. Hi, Jennifer. Thank you to Marion. That's ex an excellent talk, so we really enjoy you taking your time. And I'm, I'm glad that Harmony could help out. That was really special to have her join the talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, she always joined my uh, Zoom meetings, but today I was like, okay, this is a pretty much uh, a little more serious and time talks. So I'm like, you, you can't come, but she, she has to show. She's, she's adorable. Maybe while we're waiting, you could let folks know you were you were supposed to be coming to Boston for a meeting. What meeting was that you were supposed to attend? Yeah, I was going to the um, IABC. It's a behavior conference, um, behaviorist with all sort of animals. So it was organized in Boston, and that's um, it's if you're interested in behavior, they actually moved this conference to an online conference, and it's called the Lemonade Conference because life when life gives you lemons, you can make lemonade. So which is what this uh, organization did. And it's going to be actually pretty cheap to attend like three days of uh, full-time conferences and you can still, they will be recorded. And so if you register for the conference, you can um, still um, watch the, the talks uh, for like a year. So it's, they made something quite exceptional. I think it's anyone loving animal behavior uh, and having a little bit of time could, could register. It's, um, you type it the Lemonade Conference. So. I was also going to go to the New England Aquarium to talk about uh, well welfare because they, they do a lot of research and I was very interested in knowing more about what they're doing so I can maybe apply some of it here in, in Quebec and um, and uh, I wanted to visit you guys because I've never been to Tufts but uh, probably another time. Yeah, definitely some other time. Thank you. We have After. a question from Sophia. Oh, good. You're coming on to say it. Yes, I, I would like if you would uh, recommend any book or studies on the subject that resume a little bit what you said. Ah, good questions. I don't know if I could think about any book because every single of these things, it would be a full book on their own. You know, it depends on, you know, what you're really interested in. And, and a lot of this is sort of new and not really written in books yet. Even like there's a great book from Georgia Mason on stereotypic behavior in animals. And uh, it's already getting almost outdated because it's still a, a great book and I love it, but a lot of it's changed with the new discoveries. Um, uh, it's like for dogs, there's Decoding Your Dog is a great book on dog behavior. Um, but it's it's practical. It's not talking too much about how the brain works. Um, 
Um, maybe you can email me, Sophia, and ask me if you want like more specific, because even like there's books on zoo animal behaviors, but just to learn normal behaviors. Um, and they will have some of the contents of what is classical conditioning, operant conditioning, all of these basics in behavior. I could probably mail you a couple of um, um, references that you could uh, start reading, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Marie. A... Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, could you just repeat the wildlife welfare conference that you mentioned, the second one? Uh, it's it's not a it's not a wildlife one. Uh, the second one. You said the lemonade conference, and then you mentioned another one. I must have misheard. Um. Oh no! I was just sorry. I was just going to the New England Aquarium. Oh, New England. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was not a conference. It was more a an informal meeting with their okay. researchers and um. Yeah. Okay, thank you. The whales. Sounds good. <laughs> okay. Um, we have um, someone s saying their microphone doesn't work, so I'm going to ask for you. Um, it says, uh, I was wondering if you have experience with the fear free approach in cats and dogs. Yeah, sure. So that's really uh, part of what what we're doing. So the fear free, um, it's um, it's now it's a brand name um, for the the fear free program. There's a great online program to teach um, um, animal owner, dog, cats, horses is coming soon uh, about how to approach animals in a in a better way to promote um, animal welfare, decrease stress. Um, so I think the, this this is a great program. If you're talking specifically the Fear Free, if we were talking in general, I think I mean that existed before Fear Free. I mean when I was um, working in mixed practice in France and I had cats and I, I would I would intuitively know how to use this type of approach. So I think um, they've done a great job with putting this together. There are other programs doing that too. Um, and I think it's it's really the way to go, but I think a lot of clinics were already doing it. Um, I think, I mean, if you can read the animal behavior and change your own behavior to decrease stress, I mean, who wants to, to intentionally stress our cats or dogs? I think when veterinarians or vet techs are doing it, it's because they, they don't read the behavior very well or they don't they're not creative enough to know how to change it or they've not they've been taught a way and so it's hard to do it another way um and their own stress is important too so i love this approach and i think there's more and more research coming out to show that when we actually use the fear-free approach or anything that decreases the stress of our cats and dogs in the hospital it actually decreases our own stress which is something extremely important also so i don't know if that's <clears throat> what you were looking for it, but it's definitely something that I think we should uh, um, move uh, forward into. It's definitely the way to go. Thank you for this question. Uh, Vivian um, has a question too, um, and we're, we have five minutes left, just a reminder. Um, it says, uh, here in New England, we see many dogs presenting isolation distress, AKA separation anxiety. And while anecdotal seems to be higher in rescue shelter dogs, can you explain what might be happening in the brain of these animals? Well, thank you, that's an uh, excellent question. And uh, the answer um, is, I don't know what's happening in the brain of these dogs. Uh, and I would love to know, and we're actually doing some studies to find like some, some biobanical markers uh, for separation anxiety um, that could help us understand the pathophysiology better. But what I can tell you from the research that has been done is that true separation anxiety um, when I mean true separation anxiety, I mean not separation anxiety that's going to go away on its own in, in one month, you know. It's normal for a dog or to a certain extent to be stressed when left alone. It's not normal behavior for dogs to be completely alone with no humans in the house. Um, so, but usually their brain is able to learn 
that being alone is not that bad, that they can rest and that people will come back. So even like, because we're studying separation anxiety and we're teaching beagles uh, that school after they're adopted. Um, and you would think these beagles, when you put them alone, they will have separation anxiety because for years they've never been alone. Well, if their brain is normal, they actually learn very quickly within the months to be alone and they're fine and they learn that they can sleep and, and be fine. At first, the first week they show signs of separation anxiety, but then they don't without any intervention. Okay. So when I call it true separation anxiety is that dogs that get worse over time. So they panic when they're alone and then they panic more and more and more to a stage that can be actually quite bad with real panic attack, destruction, self mutilation. Um, there's a lot uh, that we see with separation anxiety and can be very severe. So these dogs, what's happening in their brain is that we believe it's genetic because we could never find any environmental factor that is affecting it. So it's not because these dogs are over attached to their clients. A lot of dogs are super attached to people and that's why we have dogs. I mean, why would we detach them from us? I mean, if I have a cat or a dog, I want them to be, to love me, but I don't want to be the only source of security for them because their brain sometimes is just so dysfunctional that they, they cannot function well when you're not there. And that's brain dysfunction. And that's very much treatable with medication that will reactivate some pathway and put the dog in dog brain in, in a mode that it will be able to learn like a normal dog and redo these paths in the brain with these meds to show that, okay, I've been alone, I'm fine, I didn't die probably next day is gonna be better and then better and then better. And that's what separation anxiety medications do. Um, and that's why I don't do much behavioral therapy for um, separation anxiety. I can, I can I do it a little bit before we, we, we leave the dog and after to calm them down. But when we're not there, there's no real behavior modification we can do. Well, of course, we change the environment and all that. But really the medication will put the brain in the mode where it can learn to be a normal dog, learn to relax and learn that it's gonna be fine, okay? So I know how to treat it. So I know which neurotransmitters are doing it in the brain, but where in the brain and how to detect it, which gene it is, we've not found that out yet, but eventually we will because definitely it's a disease and I strongly believe it's a genetic disease. It's not caused by the environment. If we see it more in rescue dogs, it's because people with dogs with separation anxiety will um, um, leave them in shelters more because they, um, they, they, they don't know what to do with the separation anxiety and, and the dogs will destroy everything or bark and bother the neighbors. So that's why they're left in shelters. The, that's probably why there's more in the shelter. It's not because we, we, we think it's like, oh, they've been left once, so they feel like they're gonna be left again. I don't know, I'm not in their head, but if that's what it is, if it's not brain dysfunction, they usually get over the separation anxiety pretty quickly. Um, versus when it's a disease, when it's a real brain dysfunction that we see in dogs that have never been abandoned before and that have had a perfectly normal environment and they still have separation anxiety. Um, then I, I believe it's the real brain dysfunction and we need to treat it with medication. I, I hope that answered your question, Vivian. Thank you for asking it. It's, it's a very interesting topic of research. Uh, she says, thank you. And it's 1.30, but one quick question we had um, is what is the medication for separation anxiety? Well, what's, um, yeah, what's labeled in, what's um, approved in dogs is Clomicalm. It's a clomipramine. It's an antidepressant, actually. So it, it will act on the serotonin pathways and also promotes new, new growth of normal pathway, new neurons and all. Um, so it's what's um, labeled. We sometimes, oh, I think in the U.S. you also have fluoxetine, Reconcile. Um, we don't have it in Canada anymore, but uh, so it's really fluoxetine and clomipramine is what veterinarians usually use, but we can use other things too. It depends. Every patient, again, it's a different story for every patient in behavior. Thank you so much. Um, I'm go we have a lot of thank yous and hellos in the comments in the chat, so I will send that to you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and I'll be catching up with you soon. Thank you so much, Marion. Well, thank you everyone for attending and taking your time during this weird uh, pandemic thing. So I was happy to.
Thank, Thank you. you. And if I don't see you guys. Thank you. And yes, the recording Thank will you. be available on the website after. Yay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.